installment of the fourth installment of this uh, uh, colloquium series on quantitative life sciences. It is a great pleasure to have with us today, Professor Ignacio Pagunavaraga. Uh, Ignacio did his uh, PhD from the University of Barcelona. He was uh, then a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute of Molf in Amsterdam and at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, subsequent to that, he rejoined the University of Barcelona as a professor from 2001. And uh, since 2017, he's been the, from 2017, he's been the director at uh, CCAM at the Ecole Polytechnique at Lausanne, Switzerland, EPFL. Um, Ignacio is well known for his, uh, for a number of his works in biological physics and soft and active matter. And um, today he's going to, uh, so today he's going to talk to us about uh, uh, morphologies, uh, sorry, I should have the doc title. Uh, So, sorry, so today's uh, the talk title for today's colloquium is going to be uh, Emerging Morphologies and Phase Transitions in Active Matters. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, Ignacio. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much for, for Nithun for this invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here with you. And um, as uh, we can just start presentation, hopefully you see it. So then, as uh, Nathan was saying, I, I will be talking about emerging morphologies and phase transitions in active matter. Uh, as mentioned, I'm currently the CCAM director, so I stay in EPFL at campus, but uh, this is the EPFL campus over the Lemon Lake. I, I'm also a professor at the University of Barcelona, where I will return when I finish my, my term as director. So, I, I will be talking about active systems and active systems, as uh, you all know, are materials or systems that where the basic constituents can convert internal energy into mechanical work, into autonomous motion. And, and therefore, these are systems that are out of equilibrium intrinsically and in a way conform a different class from more traditional non-equilibrium systems where you force them uh, for example, by a pressure gradient or by an electric field. And, uh, and I mean, there, there are many realizations of these systems, but inspiration comes naturally from, from biology, from nature. And you can find them in, in many different scales, starting from molecular motors inside cells. You have then cells, organisms uh, around, and all of them in one way or another can be put on, under this very generic umbrella. And, but th there are also uh, realizations that are done now on, on the lab. And for example, here you can see these are colloids where you see the, collection, the collective motion of, of an ensemble of these colloids that because of an uh, electro hydrodynamic instability are able to start rotating. And when they move together, they can give rise to intriguing patterns here you can think that they are runners in this, in this uh, particular circuit. Uh, and also, and this is just an example of a different scale, in college we're talking of micron-sized particles. Uh, there, there is also quite current a lot of interest in, in having robots. Now we are talking of, of scale of, of millimeters or centimeters, in which by simple rules, they can also conform complex uh, structures and, and here there is no clear leader, there are simple rules of, of how they see each other. Uh, this is uh, an example of these robots, they have a sensor and simply a sensor and the ability to, to slowly move around, it's enough to create non-trivial emerging patterns. And, and, and you can think the same if you think in, in cellular tissues or if you think in colonies of, of uh, uh, microorganisms or, or uh, birds, there is no clearly always one element that is deciding how the whole assembly should form. It's rather an emerging property and it's intrinsically related to how these systems behave out of equilibrium. So 
what I what I mean the the fact that that they are I, I already mentioned this a couple of times that they are intrinsically out of equilibrium conform them with properties that are qualitatively different from what we know uh, from uh, equilibrium statistical physics and thermodynamics and I like to to talk about this this is an already a relatively old example but I think it's it's very uh, illustrative. Uh, of, of experiments done with E. coli. So you, you know, E. coli are bacteria that basically displace, I mean, they have flagella and then they more or less move along a straight path. And then from time to time, this flagella uh, disassemble or change their sense of rotation. And that creates a certain um, stochasticity or change in the directionality of motion. And, and that's how you, you, I mean, this is what is called run and tumble. So they move for a while and change quite abruptly or in a very short period, the direction, and then they, they perform this, this set of uh, zigzagging or uh, uh, trajectories, if you want. Uh, now, if, if you, I mean, this, you know that uh, with bacteria, we, we know how to do many things with them. In particular, you can then make them fluorescent. So you can see them. So these are green fluorescent bacteria. And then they, this experiment, they put it in a box in which there is here, a set of barriers uh, that these, these are these triangular barriers that are organized so that then on the left hand side the the section is wider than on the right hand side so it's like a set of entropic uh, constraints and 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 the the side of the of these barriers is comparable to the typical length of this run and tumble motion of the of the bacteria. Now, if this would be an equilibrium system, bacteria do not have very strong uh, attractive or repulsive interactions. So you could expect that this is like a gas of these bacteria. They would fill the the whole system uniformly. But here, rather, what you see is that they self trap on the right hand side. So this is a simple but striking example of how. The, the, the fact that they are not in equilibrium. So if this motion that I talk about would satisfy fluctuation dissipation theorem, they would, then they would be thermalized everywhere. But now they self-trap because in a way they, because of the way they move, it's more difficult for them to escape out of this uh, narrow constraint rather than being sort of like funnel from left to right uh, from this uh, wider, uh, in a way, basin uh, that, that drives them to the right. Um, so they self-segregate. And it, it, now you can start thinking about it because if instead of just putting one of these walls, you think on a box where now you organize these traps or these hindrance uh, so that then you favor a flow from bottom to top here on the right-hand side, but then there now you put them in a way that you favor a motion from right to left. Now you can have a, another type of behavior where bacteria will start generating a vortex so they will start flowing and then you will have a sustained flow in the system and if you want a related but complementary uh, system is this other experimental uh, setup by Di Leonardo where well, what you see here is a wheel which is suspended in a bath of these bacteria the same bacteria now here they are not fluorescent uh, but then you can see these uh, these dark spots that move around are the bacteria and again the, in this case, the asymmetry in how they move along the two sides of the wheel lead to a similar behavior where bacteria can rectify the motion of the wheel. So eventually you could extract work out of this system. The efficiency is very low, but that's again an, an example of how these systems exhibit behavior that is qualitatively different from what we know in equilibrium. Um, I, I, what I will be looking today, it's about implications of this behavior in how they collectively uh, uh, active matter systems organize. Uh, I will be considering more simplified systems than these biological ones. Uh, another important aspect, especially when we look at small scales, is that bacteria, microorganisms, small particles moving at these colors I was referring to, they are not displacing in vacuum. They need a medium to displace. For example, Chlamydomonas is it's another micro is a microorganism that has two flagella, and then by beating the flagella can displace. The, these objects, as they these microorganisms as they displace, they 
they perturb the flow around it. I mean, these are flow measurements and because they beat, it's actually a time dependent flow. Therefore, it means that it's not only their motion, it's the fact that the medium is perturbed and because they are out of equilibrium, they generate sustained flows. That has also important consequences because now if instead of just having one climate monas, you have two of them, then these flows affect their motion. This is what is called hydrodynamic interactions. And it means that then even if they are not close, then they can be correlated and organized their motion accordingly. And again, going back to the examples of the molecular motors I was mentioning before, the, this is uh, uh, motors, molecular motors move along microtubules. Uh, this is a, a, a video of a cell microscopy. Of, this is a plant cell that is quite long and the, 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 the wall of the cell is covered by these microtubules actually I don't know if you if you see this this axis here uh, actually distinguishes two parts. Microtubules have opposite polarity in the two sides, and as a result, when motors move along, they do not only move; they generate flow in the cell, and therefore they contribute to an active transport. In this case, advective that is more efficient than pure diffusion. Here, what you see moving around are different type of organelles that are inside the cell that are being advective along. So the active motion of motors also ha can have important metabolic implications, for example, in the life cycle of cells. And I will come back to this uh, later also in the presentation. So wh what I will be looking at from a physicist's point of view is how much you, we can sort of try to understand about the fundamentals or the essential features of this active uh, matter of systems by exploding simple schematic uh, models where in some cases you can make analytic progress or you can parameterize them systematically and try to identify regimes uh, on how they behave. Uh, I mean, in equilibrium, we know that at the end, everything is controlled by the, and, uh, by the conservative interactions through the Boltzmann weight and how particles move or how they correlate do not affect their face behavior, for example. We will see that this is not the case and details of uh, the, the idea of having this model, the simple model is to start to understand what are the fundamental features that play uh, 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 a critical role in the collective behavior of these systems. Uh, from this point of view of, of simple models, uh, the community tends to sort of like put them in, uh, identify, simple reference categories. So one can talk about dry or wet system. So one talks about wet when this role of the hydrodynamics of the solvent is taken into account and dry when that is uh, disregarded. And I will show you examples of both and what we can learn using one or the other. Uh, and then also the importance between repulsion and alignment, the role of steric interaction, particle shapes, all these are aspects that become important uh, because we cannot sort of like extend straightforwardly what we know from equilibrium statistical mechanics. So in this respect, I, I will be now first start talking about dry models. And the first model that was introduced was big check model. The big check model was motivated by how flocks of birds uh, fly together. And the idea is that basically you have elements that have an arrow, so they have a direction along which they want to propel, but then also there is a characteristic interaction range, and then each of these elements tend to align with the mean orientation of the neighbors. If you want a bird that is in the, in the middle of this flock, tries to sort of like uh, fly more or less in the direction that the neighboring birds fly. That's the schematics of it, and then you can write down a relatively simple model where you say, meaning two dimensions for simplicity. The position of the particle depends on this vector, E is the vector, has an intrinsic circumpolar velocity, and then this vector is, can be um, quantified by an angle, and then the angle changes, I mean, there is always a bit of noise here, and then it tends to be uh, parallel. So it looks at the neighbors, and then there is a torque that aligns them if the angle is not the same. Now, this is the very, first one, then there are variants of this model. I will not go into that. And, and there has been a lot of effort to try to classify uh, depending whether the motion is polar, so they tend to align in the direction. It could also be that tend to align 
along the direction, but could be in the along or anti-aligning, and that's not relevant for birds, but in other cases, that's then animatic. Uh, and then there are cases where then there, there are some things that are known about when or how instabilities develop and which type of patterns uh, emerge depending on these basic symmetries. I wouldn't say it's still completely understood, but there are quite a number already of studies. And if you want for the polar case, for example, it is known that depending on the noise that I was telling you and the density, you will have low densities, high levels of noise, a gas. But then as you increase the, the concentration, then they form a homogeneous liquid that all of it moves along. And in between these two phases, there is an extended region uh, where bands are observed. And that's where uh, that's probably more striking visually. There are these bands of so here color, light color is high density. So particles tend to form structure set of bands that move along. And, and this is uh, a density profile of one of these bands. So the density is high in the front, the ones in the back are pushing, then they move together. Yeah? If, if you have now a pneumatic ordering, so it can go in the same direction or in opposite directions, uh, the, the behavior is completely different uh, and is much more intricate and involved. And I would say this is still not as well understood as the, as the pneumatic, as the polar case. The, the other reference active system for, for dry active matter is active Brownian particles. And, and this builds on what we know again in equilibrium from Brownian particles. Now here you, you can think of particles that simply perform random walk. And then again, they have this arrow that tells the direction they want to move. So again, if the dynamics can be written as, as for the big check, uh, the, the velocity is, is determined by the self propellant velocity along the direction. And here again, what they call NI was EI before. Sorry for the notation by picking equations from different sources, but I hope it's not too confusing. Now, the particles can also have uh, conservative forces. If you think in, in hard spheres I and mean, it would collide, or if you think on a very a stiff potential, so that's that's the total force acting on particle I due to the interaction between particles and then the noise. Yeah. So if there wouldn't be this V0 and I, this is simple random uh, Brownian motion. So it's like round, Brownian motion with a directionality. And again, in two dimensions, the angle here will have a a noise and there is only noise here there is no alignment as before um, that seems a, a minimal change on on a brownian motion model on a random walk but has profound consequences and and that's because due to this directionality what happens is that when two particles approach and collide this directionality, this, this arrow that you see means that they tend to keep on colliding until the random motion, the, the angular rotation allows them to move away. So it gives a, a set of uh, persistence or stubbornness. This, these are like the stubborn spheres that keep on colliding. And that changes quite dramatically the behavior. Actually, I mean, this is a, a, a visual, uh, let's see, yeah, that's a, a visual way to show a phase diagram. So here you have the density on the one hand and the velocity. So if density, if the velocity is weak, I mean, here is equilibrium. So these are repelling spheres. So they, they will form a, a, a fluid until they will crystallize eventually. But if you, if you now increase this propulsion speed, what you will see is that then at some point, there is a condensation transition between a gas and something that is not a solid is more like a liquid. And, and this is really associated to this stubbornness. So this is an intrinsically out of equilibrium transition. It's called a motility induced phase separation or MIPS. And, and this is a, a also another example uh, of how activity and then in this case, excluded volume lead to novel phases. The, the nice thing of these simple models is that, I mean, aside, uh, that we can sort of correlate to what, to, to what we know about Brownian motion is that if we, if we express this in dimensionless units, it allows us to identify how, what are the relevant parameters. In this case, uh, the relevant parameter is the Peckley number, which is a ratio between this self-propelling velocity and the rotational diffusion. If you want, is the time it takes or the particle propels before it sort of decorrelates. Uh, because of the repulsion, the, the I, I'm always considering very highly repulsive particles, but 
uh, the, the, the um, conservative interaction is characterized by, by, by a typical energy scale epsilon. So there will be another term that will tell you how important is the conservative force compared to the propulsion force. We will always be showing you results where this gamma is very large. So they can never penetrate uh, each other. And then the density, how many we have. So it means that if we have these three parameters um, that are relevant, then if, if I work at very, it's always very hard particles, essentially this is a two-dimensional, the, the phase space is two-dimensional. So by plotting the proportion of speed or better the Peclet number and density, I can cover the whole set of regimes these systems can, can uh, exhibit. Uh, and that's basically something we look at. So we look systematically. So basically, uh, typically, if you change the Peclet number uh, here on the y-axis and here the concentration, uh, basically, as, as, we, as I was showing you in the previous um, slide, if the Peclet number is large enough, then there can be this coexistence between a gas, a low density phase, and a high density phase, which is this MIPS. And you can also compute the spinoral, so you can characterize the whole uh, phase separation of coexistence uh, as in, in terms of, of what we know from equilibrium, even if this is an unequilibrium system. But then uh, we know also that if the Peclet number is zero, and, and here I, I will be showing you two-dimensional simulations, so we have disks rather than spheres. Uh, if we are in equilibrium, so the x-axis, there, what happens is that in the x-axis, in, in, in equilibrium, disks will form a liquid solid transition that is mediated by an exotic phase. So we also were wondering, uh, beyond the, 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 the properties of, of the uh, MIPS itself, how does this phase separation good interfere, coexist uh, with what we know that should happen in equilibrium. And, and this is what you see here in this second uh, phase diagram. Again, this is the Peclet number. Sorry, it's turn it uh, uh, left, right because of how this was published. But you, you can see again, uh, this is a logarithmic scale. So the, this uh, gray area here is basically what you have here on the right. And then here at zero, you will have the disordered phase, then this, uh, this blue region is the exotic phase, and then here is the solid. So if you look here, I mean, this now the inset is a zoom or what happens here, uh, because it happens very quickly. You, you have a first order phase transition between a fluid and an exotic. So gray here means coexistence. And then afterwards, there is a second order phase transition between the exotic and the solid. And I mean, that has been characterized in equilibrium. And what this shows you is that when you start becoming active, and that's one by through the Peclet number, that's the nice thing of having this uh, Brownian system or this, this set of particles where we know the equilibrium uh, phase diagram, the, what, what this tells us is this, the activity favors disorder. So it's pushing to the right, the disorder, the gas phase, so exotic enters later. And then at some point, the phase transition changes from first order to second order. So it changes the nature of the transition. Then you will have a liquid exotic solid. And then as you keep on increasing the Peclet number at some point, here there will be like a triple point because here this is the coexistence between this, the gas and the MIPS phase. And then MIPS here will coexist with the exotic. And then at some point, if you keep on moving up, at some point you will have also a coexistence between a gas and the solid. So at some point, uh, the equilibrium sort of like takes over the, the MIPS or it sort of like converges with the MIPS. So, so the, this tells you that because at some point we were wondering if this, what we were characterizing as MIPS could have been understood as an extension of the exotic or solid into the non-equilibrium, but clearly these are two distinct uh, phase transitions. Um, now, the, this is what we learned for these disks uh, in 2D, in 3D. There has been also subsequently studies also in 3D that lead to similar behavior. Uh, now, what, what I wanted to look at, uh, th these models also offer us a way to build on and, and try to analyze other aspects. Here I've been talking about really a minimal case where you have a sphere, excluded volume, and then self-propulsion. Uh, what about now 
the, the particle shape or alignment that I was talking about, bit check, for example. And the nice thing of, of this Brownian active model is that you can easily now build on it and enrich it. And so here, what, what I was considering, as, as, as I was telling you before, uh, the shape, for example, if you have elongated particles, actually many microorganisms are not spheres, will have a natural tendency to align. That's a physical mechanism, if you want, for this type of uh, big check type alignment I was referring to. And, and again, the alignment can be polar if, if they're, they're, for example, they have a clear shape and directionality. Some, some bacteria switch direction, sometimes they move along in one direction or another along a preferential axis. And that then uh, sets a case where you will have a nematic ordering rather than a polar ordering. And in equilibrium, we know that the shape can lead or will give rise to all the type of phases, not only the liquid solid that they were referring to, but then you have meso mes mesogenic uh, phases like the pneumatic or an asmectic phase. So we could ask the question, what happens in these active systems? And, and something that we wanted to look at is to so here again, and we can distinguish the fact of what, what is the role of shape and what is the role of alignment. So again, for the sake of understanding the role of alignment in these active systems, one could, we were interested in, in keeping the still the spherical or the disk shape. So we do not consider the role of shape to promote alignment, but just activity itself by uh, considering the same model that I was telling you before. So again, this is the same particles perform Brownian motion with self-propulsion, but now the changing angle is not only noise, there is this alignment that I was telling you, big check light. So two disks will have a tendency to align with respect to each other. We could also make the disks rotate, which are parallel. I, I will mention this later. Sorry? Is there, Sorry, is there a question? Uh... No? Okay. So uh, forget about W, this omega. So if this is zero, so before I was showing you that the angle was changing randomly, but now there is a tendency to align. And then we want this is a, in, in the, the context of dynamical systems, this is a Kuramoto type interaction. And uh, we know that that can lead to so synchronization in this case of self-propelling entities. Now, in terms of, of how to make the dimensionless parameters, now we introduce this next term, the, the, a new term. So before we have the concentration and then the Peclet number, now we'll have another dimensionless parameter, I call it G, which is a ratio between the, the, the rate at which this K is associated to a rate at which particles align. And then this will compete to the rate at which they can disalign due to the noise. So that gives rise to another parameter. Yeah. So again, if G is zero, then is what we had before. And then if G is different from zero, now there is this tendency for, for disks to align. So if I work at the density, now we have a three dimensional phase space. Uh, so if I work at densities where we don't have MIPS, uh, when G is zero here, then, and I move along the number, I will essentially have a disordered phase. This disordered phase I was showing you before. And then as I increase now G, this tendency to align, what we observe is that at some point, these disks will be able to form flocks that can move together. And here I show you, these are snapshots of, of what we have here B, this is the disordered phase. And then when I, we were here in D, E, F, we have these structures. Actually, what we also saw is that there was like a phase uh, that was uh, a bit intriguing where we, we were observing global order, polar order. So they were moving together, but forming uh, a distribution of clusters. They were not merging in a macroscopic cluster that was comparable to the system size. And then there was subsequently a percolation transition towards these other structures. Okay, so that's again a characteristic of, of this, uh, this that you don't see in big chain model, models with point particles. And, and when we look a little bit more about these macroscopic or structures that are system size, these morphologies that can develop over the whole system, again, what we saw is that, I mean, there were two types of uh, morphologies in. in in big check, as I showed you before, typically there are these bands. So 
particles organize in bands with a larger density in the front. And that's what you see here on the left, on the right hand side. But here on the left, we also saw cases, if, if the Peclet number was not large enough, where particles, I mean, in the bands, the particles are oriented perpendicular to, to the band, but there were cases where particles were aligned along the band. So then we call these lanes. In this case, particles are moving, but the lane is not displacing. And again, we attributed that due to the fact that because of excluded volume, you cannot get to densities that are large enough, at very large densities, even you, you form a band. But here at some point, there is a preference then to align uh, in the opposite direction. And uh, as far as we could identify, this was a crossover. So we didn't identify a kind of a singular mechanism leading from lane to bands. But at least this tells you that this competition between excluded volume, persistence, and alignment can give you uh, large structures that are richer than those that are obtained simply by, by the big check model. Uh, excuse me, Ignacio, can I just ask yeah. you? So uh, within the bands, you see the lines. This is what you mentioned by lanes, right? You see the structure of the particle seems to be structurally ordered. Is it, is it what you meant by lanes? Well, well, well I, I mean, you, you can see that they are ordered. Clearly, in, in the case of lanes, the packing is, is higher than the case of the bands. In the case of the bands, packing is higher in the front, and then it becomes more diluted. Well, here, the whole structure is very highly packed. And that's what you see, uh, because you, you could almost see no, this, this uh, uh, it's, it's more like a solid, if you want. But when you look at the motion of the particles, they are displacing along. So they, they keep on moving. So unfortunately, this is not, uh, if I can stop it, so it's not visible here. But so this is really like a lane, uh, a, a file of these particles that are oriented along the lane. So they can move along uh, through, the, through the boundaries and defects uh, uh, along this, this, what we call lane. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, hello, uh, hello, Ignacio. Can you, yes. Can you, yeah. yeah. So is, uh, is this omega is equal to zero case? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the omega zero case. So here okay. I'm talking about self-propulsion and then this alignment that I was describing in big check or that you can refer to a Kuramoto type. I mean, at the end, it's the same type of nema uh, polar type of alignment with the name. So. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So I... Then now it comes to the chirality. I will not go too much into the chirality, but uh, again, eh? so we, we now can sort of like add on another contribution, which is now what happens when you have chirality? What happens if each particle tends to uh, rotate around, uh, uh, around it? And, and again, biologically, that is uh, known that, for example, even for this E. coli that I was telling you, when they come close to a wall, they start performing uh, circles and that's associated to the chirality on, on how the flagella are moving. There is a, uh, the, 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 the body and the flagella are rotating in opposite direction. It has a, an intrinsic chirality. So again, you can introduce chirality at, for this type of ABP models at the simplest case, simply by saying that you have an intrinsic frequency. And then you introduce another parameter. So now we have four. So we have a concentration, the Peclet number, the tendency of particles to align, and then the rotation, the, the rate at which they rotate with respect to the rate at which they decorrelate. And again, if you have a single particle, uh, the combination of the velocity and this frequency will lead to a trajectory that is a circle. And the radius of the circle essentially is the ratio between v and omega. Uh, here, I'm con I will be showing you some initial results that were published where they were considering point particles. Here, I'm missing the, the bit of the uh, conservative and so on. That's something that can be introduced later. I simply wanted to tell you about how this chirality leads to an again new type of phases to lowest order. I, I don't know if there is a request for a question. Yeah, Apratim, can you please ask? Yeah, so in this uh, set of equations, in the top equation, r dot alpha, I don't see the noise term. So no, this is, as I said, this is simply for simplicity, what I'm going to show you. Okay. Uh, that, that was like the first step. Obviously, follow up is to introduce noise and to introduce uh, hysteric okay. direction. Okay. So, so I, I didn't, yeah. In the rotational diffusion, yes. yeah. but not in the straight motion. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's true that this is something I, I didn't emphasize in the previous models. I, I was always showing you translational, I mean, diffusion or noise in the translation and rotation. And I, I did that because of analogy. I was building on this analogy with, with Brownian motion. And in Brownian motion in equilibrium, the because of fluctuation dissipation, the amplitude of the translational and rotational uh, noise are related to each other as well. Huh? So here I, but however, most of the phenomenology I've shown you is really controlled by the rotational noise because that's that's the noise that leads to this uh, stubbornness that I was referring to. So that, that's a, an interesting question in itself to understand when translational diffusion plays a role. It, in what I've been showing you, it doesn't play a critical role. So for the same reason, you can introduce noise here for consistency in terms of the physics of the or the biology of the model, but I don't think it's the critical parameter, okay? Uh, this is, then, yeah. uh, quick. So, um, so this lane forming, is it also might be a consequence of the lack of um, uh, noise in the translational motion or? No, no. okay, in the lane- is robust. No, in the, no, it's robust, it's robust. Yeah, it, it really, it's really a competition between the, the, the peckle, so how much persistence particles have with respect to how quickly they align with respect to each other. I think that's the driving mechanism behind the, the lane more than the, the noise itself. Okay. Thanks. Uh, now, what happens then if you have this uh, case? So again, eh? so, so you have more parameters. So now I'm showing you only cuts on what is a more complex uh, phase space. But here, uh, if, so here the, the x-axis is the intrinsic, uh, the chirality of the particles. If they are not chiral, you know, we have a disordered phase. And then if we have this G, this sort of like aligning, then we will have in principle over here, <clears throat> the, um, uh, the, 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 the liquid ordered phase that we know for big check. But then very quickly, it leads to a segregation of droplets. So, so the, 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 the typical, the main features are either, I mean, if the alignment is, is not very high, essentially there is a disordered phase and then they tend to form droplets. So what they observed was either what they call microflux or so small droplets. And then at some point there was a region where there was a macroscopic droplet coexisting. And here this whole region was coexistence between the two as much as they could say. Still, I think this requires a bit more detailed analysis, but I would say the main features now is that chirality leads to the formation of these aggregates that are rotating and, and they seem to be able to coexist, not coarsen as much as they could do in the simulations. There was no observation of a global coarsening always, okay. Uh, we, we observe though, if, if you, so I, I will finish this part by showing you the case in which this is all particles rotating the same, yeah? So we, we thought, well, what happens if now you have half of them rotating to the right, half of them rotating to the left? On average, there is no chirality. So globally, the system is not chiral, but there is an intrinsic chirality. And not surprisingly, if you now, again, eh, if, if the, there is no, no alignment, you have a disordered phase, as you increase the tendency to align, then these two phases, the two type of particles tend to segregate. In this case, they segregate forming an, a macroscopic object. Uh, so in that sense, the, the fact of having this dispersion kills these this micro droplets that I was telling you. And, and also what it happens is that it, if now we come to this vertical axis when there is no friction, no, no chirality essentially, you have flocking. And interestingly here, probably the fact that we have these two species enhances the region where you can have mutual flocking. So this is a phase, this is a snapshot where you have right moving and left moving particles. So these are the blue and the left, but they keep on passing to each other, through each other. And then they tend to, the, the fact that they are in, encountering particles that are rotating in the opposite direction, do not allow them to explore completely these ro this global rotational objects. And, and it's really like, if you look statistically, it looks like a flocking phase, like the one I was telling you for big check, 
but now for particles with uh, chirality. So if you want, the presence of two species allows to extend this uh, bicheck type phase, uh, even in regimes where there is a net chirality. Okay, so, I mean, I've, I've sort of like shown you how you can use these dry model systems really to explore features. I mean, rather than looking into realistic systems, I've tried to analyze what is the role of persistence, what is the role of alignment, uh, and, and what are the relevant dimensionless parameters that allow us to classify the different phases, the different emergent structures that, that appear in these systems. I wanted to use the last 10 minutes uh, to now move on. I'm sorry, there, I, it seems like there is a question. Um, Sarika. Sarika? Uh, hi. hi. Uh, this is a follow up of a previous question that Aprotim asked uh, about this not having the uh, noise in the translational term. Yeah. So I'm just trying to think, and you said it is dominated by the Petle number. That is because if you have a propulsion, then your uh, noise in the translational motion is almost not having an effect, right? Because of the activity of a directional, uh, like in one particular direction, that uh, noise. So you do not, you can do away with the noise in the translational term. Is that, is that why you think? Yeah, that, that, that's, you that's, like that? that's uh, yeah, that's intuitively how. So you, you could wonder. So uh, as the velocity starts increasing. Uh, the, if you want the velocity, the, the, the propulsion velocity and the rotational diffusion can define an effective temperature, if you want, associated to, I mean, because the particle actively, just if you think of propulsion and rotational diffusion, particle then still performs a random walk on long scales, but then there, there is this persistence. Uh, as, a, as a result, if you characterize the random walk of a, one single particle on long times it diffuses with an effective temperature that is determined by this velocity and this rotational diffusion now this temperature tends to be typically much larger than the temperature at, at which the system is thermalized so that's why right. the, the rate of noise is much smaller obviously if you if you think a bit more in detail in this limit that i refer to if you try to go to the limit in which now you go the velocity, you take the velocity to zero to go to go back to equilibrium. There will be a window where these two temperatures, if you want, will be similar. If you want, when the right. thermal noise will not be negligible to the self proportion as you were saying, there it's a regime where then, if you want to understand this regime more quantitatively, then translational noise will make will play a role. But, but I don't think it will change qualitatively the trends that I was describing. Yeah. Right, thank okay. you. Okay, so let, let me take the last, uh, say, six minutes or seven minutes to at least uh, show you when we move to wet, wet models, how much the medium uh, plays a role. Because in all I've told you up to now, medium, the medium, the, the environment, the liquid, uh, doesn't exist. And, and it's good because it helps us to, to learn a lot. But it, it doesn't mean that it's negligible. And then I, I, I wanted to show you also how relevant and subtle its effect can be. Okay, and I will do that with one example that then goes back to the to the uh, introduction. I was talking about the cytoplasmatic streaming, the fact that in in cells, uh, molecular motors move collectively on on microtubules, uh, on, 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 uh, and then if these microtubules are organized in the cell for other purposes, then that can lead to a net flow, for example. And, and this is another example from with another, with another cell. So again, and uh, you know, molecular motors uh, are uh, micro, I mean, there are molecules that are able to, to I, I was talking about micro tools, but they can also be active filaments and, and different type of, of biofilaments. And, and then they, by consuming uh, ATP, they are able to, uh, change their conformation, and then that can lead to a rectification on how they move. And then if they are attached to cargos, for example, when they move, then, then as you can imagine, this is moving and then it will be uh, sort of like generating a flow along. Forces are very small. Uh, and actually, I mean, this is an example of a particular uh, Keith 1A. Uh, 
that sort of like it's when it polymerizes. I mean, sorry, when it uh, uh, uses the, the ATP, then it can detach partially, and then it can stay in in a conformation that is not so strongly bound. And 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 this difference between being strongly bound and weakly bound to the to the filament, it's enough to allow it to displace if this process of binding and unbinding does not satisfy again fluctuation dissipation the, the, the reaction if you want is out of equilibrium and the simplest model for this type of motion again within this uh, using say a brownian particle it's it's a brownian ratchet where you have a particle sphere or a point particle that can be in two states it can either diffuse along a ratchet, so you have a binding potential that is asymmetric and that mimics uh, the details of, of the acting filament in this case. But then it can detach and then be in a regime where it doesn't feel this, this binding and then it simply diffuses freely. And this is a very simple model for, for this type of motors. It, again, if you look at what, what one of these particles will perform, they essentially do a sort of like a, a, a motion that combines this is the displacement along the filament as a function of time. These are actually experiments uh, where then it is seen that uh, the, this, this, this motor stays for quite some time in a particular position in the filament, and then it can sort of displace, it stays there, displaces, and so on. Uh, so it's, it's like a, it's a peculiar motion that is recovered by this uh, simple model. Now, what I will be showing you, I don't go into the details, but we, we have been performing uh, computational simulations using a dissipative particle dynamics model, a, a coarse grain model of a solvent, where we have a filament, an object that is fixed, and then we have particles that will interact performing this, this coupling, and then there is all the solvent particles around, and, and this is uh, done in a, a dynamically consistent way. This is a simplified way to, to look at it, uh, to look at the systems. And then we ask the question, what happens when we have many of these uh, particles along this filament moving together? And we have one parameter, which is the size of these particles compared to the periodicity of, of, of how they move along this, this potential. And basically, this is a very busy figure because we show many things here, but let, let me, so basically here, I want you to look in this upper half. This is the average velocity that we observe. As this is the concentration. We can decide how many particles, the density of these motors in this filament. And then we look at the average velocity uh, normalized by the velocity that one single uh, particle would have. So one is the velocity that we expect for an isolated one. Now, if uh, lo look only at red triangles and green triangles for simplicity, we consider the case where the particle is as large as the periodicity of the potential. Then it means that in one of these minima, we can only fit one particle. Yes, we cannot have two of them. Now, in this model, we can switch off the coupling to the solvent, then it's Brownian dynamics. So if we do Brownian dynamics, essentially, what this tells us is that the velocity doesn't depend much on concentration. If you want particles are in the minima and they cannot really interact with each other. And then they have a velocity that is more or less uniform. I mean, at very large concentrations at some point, they hinder each other. On the other hand, when we have this hydrodynamic uh, interaction, so we, we have the solvent. So when they move, they generate the flow. Basically what happens is that now they increase their velocity quite significantly. Uh, so this is an effect, and you can see it's by can be by a factor ten. So the the amount of so they generate a flow, and then that makes them move faster. And actually, if if the size of the particle is a bit smaller than the size of the periodicity, then you can have two particles in one of these minima. So then they can sort of like push push each other. This has been uh, explored before in the context of colloids. But uh, what, what I find interesting of this case of, of, is that if you think about how they actually move, uh, sorry, let me just move uh, here. Uh, the, the behavior, so sorry, I wanted to go back. Uh, so basically, as I was telling you, th this is what particles are doing. And, and these particles are moving at what is called low Reynolds number. So there is no, I mean, 
there is no inertia. So if a particle is being pushed with a force, it will generate a flow. But if the particle is not being pushed immediately, then there is no flow in what is called the creeping uh, limit. So the, the standard assumption of how fluid dynamics works at this very low Reynolds number, the Reynolds number would be 10 to the minus three or 10 to the minus four, is that essentially only when the particle is exerting a force is generating this flow. But if you go back and look how these particles move, you could argue that most of the time, they are in the minima of this potential, so there is no force acting on them. So it's only when they walk is when they really experience then the relaxation through this uh, potential. And therefore, then in second thought, you could think, well, I mean, the, here hydrodynamics should be completely irrelevant because it's not that they are continuously being pushed along. So th this tells us that this result that I'm showing you is cannot be captured by this creeping flow assumption that the flow exists only when the particle is being pushed. And in second thought, it's not so surprising. If, if you think on a particle, if I have a particle in a flow, when I start moving it, it takes a, a time for the flow to develop. And if I stop, it will also relax because of viscosity. So there is a certain memory in the flow, even at low Reynolds number. So the flow is not steady. And because it's not steady, actually what happens is that when a particle makes a jump to, to I mean, when, when it goes from this not very bound to the bound state, then it's being forced. So during that time, it generates a flow. But if there is a nearby flow particle in this state that is not so bound, because it freely diffuses, then the flow will sort of like displace it. So it will change the, the mean of this uh, Gaussian. And that is enough to increase the probability that it can go more easily over the top of the right than, than on the left. And then is the, the, the other one that then will be end up being diffusing freely in the following minimum. So it's, it's a collective effect where one particle generates a flow and then transiently that flow can affect uh, a nearby one, helping it to rectify its motion. And you can see this, I mean, possible to quantify, I will not go into the details, but I mean, this is just a visual example where we started with three of these models close by, and then if there is excluded volume only, no hydrodynamics, then they jump. And then you can see how you have this sort of like, most of the time they are in one of these minima and then they jump, but they essentially, the jumping is rather uncorrelated. Well, here, if they are close by, when one of them jumps, then it, it helps that the other one also will rectify a little bit later on. And then they keep on being moving along for longer. And also, if you look at the number of attempts to, to be able to go from one minimum to the other, because of this coupling is smaller, which means not only that they go faster, if you think that the energy is lost by these attempts of going from the less to the more bound, because that's when they consume ATP, they need to consume less ATP. So it's more efficient as well. Yeah. And I will finish this just by showing you what happens when you have now many of them. Uh, so how they move together. So here is one of these simulations. So in the center, you will have the filament. You don't see it because we don't show it in the movie. Uh, all around, you have all the solvent particles. You don't see them. You only see the motors. And then they move along. And as they move, I mean, they have this tendency to move. There is also an emerging behavior because this tendency to move synchronously also favors the formation of a band. So the, the molecular motors that were initially uniformly distributed over the filament then aggregate and then move together along. So to me, this is an example of, of again, how the fluid flow in this case helps generating these emerging structures. And also the fact that it is this particular in a, uh, on and off motion, intermittent motion that leads to this uh, coupling associated to the diffusive, diffusive nature of momentum, which is not the standard creeping flow uh, uh, coupling that, that you normally see, which again shows the importance of understanding the dynamics and the right coupling in detail. So I'll finish here. I, I, I had another example, but I think that's again uh, showing how hydrodynamics plays a role in these systems. I will just finish simply by telling you, I hope I, I've shown you how these systems, active matter, are peculiar and are qualitatively different from other non equilibrium systems, and the use of having these exploiting dry and, and wet models to understand the relevance of the essential symmetries and 
features that determine the emergence of, of new uh, non-trivial and novel morphologies in, in these uh, systems. And obviously this has been done by people in Barcelona and also here at SICAM. And the part of uh, this, uh, the phase diagram for the disc also was done together with Letizia and Giuseppe in Paris and, and Italy. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ignacio. Uh, this was a really nice talk. Um, so we can take, we have some time for questions. Uh, so I think Sarika, yes, please. Uh, hi, uh, very interesting uh, to see this aggregation. So uh, intuitively what I can think about is particles um, affect the neighboring particles in a hydrodynamic flow and they move together and then they come and then there are particles far away which are not affected by the hydrodynamic flow, but eventually uh, they start moving together, means taking in more and more particles which can start get coupled in the hydrodynamic motion, right? Is that the picture for the aggregation in that uh, motor, in that ATP kind of a motor picture? So, yes, as you say, that, that's true. Then what also happens is if you think now that there is a density fluctuation, a region where they are a uh, higher number of these particles, then they will have an enhanced probability to move, as you say. But then also, as they sort of like favor that particles that are in the back come close to them, now the, the excluded volume, the packing, uh, favor that they stay together. So in a way, this flow, because it rectifies, so there is a directionality, uh, it will enhance. Now, the, the fact that the time one of these uh, particles tend to be together is longer if, if it's a larger concentration, will naturally absorb all the particles coming along. And then that gives rise to the growth of this, uh, of this cluster. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I have one more question, but I can ask later on if there is someone else who wants to ask a question. Please go ahead, I think. it's. So this is regarding your uh, the first part of the talk where you talked about activity. And activity can be um, included in many ways, like, you know, the direction uh, in which the particles move, sometimes they change randomly. And in that case, two particles moving in the same direction and, and like the Peckler number and the rotational motion will not give rise to some kind of uh, like pneumatic transition. So is, is there a core, like is there some kind of a dependence on how long the prop, how long the persistent time is in particular direction or, or the way the activity is included is all the particles move in only one direction. Uh, so I, I did not follow that part actually, maybe so, you mentioned so, but Yeah, so, so the, I'm, I'm not sure if I, I, if I will be answering your question. Particles have a, a, an intrinsic directionality that sets which direction they are moving in. And then there is the, the Peckle uh, quantifies the persistence. So how much they will keep on moving given a direction, that direction compared to the rotation of the future. When you talk about one direction or the other, there are other effects that I didn't discuss, which are also important, which is the fact that the mobility or in, in the direction along the axis, the preferential axis or perpendicular to the preferential axis doesn't need to be the same. And this asymmetry in, in how easily they, they react to forces through the mobility in one direction or the other also plays a role. I don't know if that's what you were referring when you said uh, one direction only. Yeah, so basically you have non-spherical particles, so probably the direction comes uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. from yeah. So If you have yeah. a spherical particle, then it, it can be random. And in that way, I think the, the chances of moving in every direction is almost average over after a certain time, right? Yeah, so uh, actually, yeah, no, that's an, an, an interesting point because you could, I mean, you can now look at what happens when you have a particle that is non-spherical, even with an spherical particle, you could also enrich the model by saying that now the mobility, I didn't emphasize too much, but there was a mobility in front of the force, it's a tensor. So the mobility in one direction along the directionality of proportion or perpendicular is different. And this ratio also has an, an effect. Like Hugh Chate has explored that to some extent. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>
uh, I had a couple of questions, Ignacia. So uh, regarding this last part of the talk, so you had this parameter, which I this I think R, uh, which you were saying is the number of particles that you know uh, fits in a minima of the potential. Yeah. So, uh, is that like so? For example, if I have uh, motors moving on microtubules, and I have uh, different motors on the different protofilaments, would that be considered as a lower value of this parameter, or is it purely to do with the size of the particle? Well, I mean, uh, again, you can. The, the way we we phrase it, uh, we did it in terms of the the actual size of the particle, but we did not uh, take into account because of simplicity about the, the role that, for example, a bundle of microtubules play. And that would also be something that we, we, we could introduce. I haven't thought to which extent you can sort of map the bundle into an effective radius. I guess to, to that, that may be possible. I, I haven't thought about it, but yeah. You, you, okay. at, the end, at the end, that R tells you how much you can pack, how many particles or how many motors you would be able to pack in in the characteristic, in the size of which these uh, filaments uh, uh, vary themselves. So, oh, okay, okay. And so another thing, so you saw this sort of enhancement of uh, velocity due to the hydrodynamic coupling at certain values of the uh, motor density. So is that something that is like a, uh, in the biological context, a realistic density? Like, are there aggregations of motors that are observed? Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it is in the sense that we don't have to work at very high densities of motor to see them. As I was saying to Sarika, it's, it's, a, it's an effect that is relatively robust and it's associated to this coupling between excluded volume and the asymmetry on the flow. So the fact that it's a persistent motion, if you have mm -hmm. a long enough filament, you will mm -hmm. see it. What, what we haven't uh, quantified is, for example, how long you need to move along a filament to develop it. So there may be a question of time scales uh, for okay. the, the, the growth, the rate growth of, of the cluster compared to the typical size of a film. Okay. And this one final thing. So if, if one extends this to bidirectional motion, like in a sense and dynines in some sense, then is there something known about this yeah. aerodynamic thing? Uh, no, I mean, that that's a, a really nice question. I, that's something I would like to, to look at because you can imagine no, that again, that can lead to, you can argue whether there, there, can, there is an, an obvious, um, competition between flows mm -hmm. generated in the two, but on the other hand, it can be a way to segregate, mm -hmm. you can break the symmetry over the mm -hmm. bottle, uh, and then generate now bidirectional flows at the level of the filaments, which would be very interesting. Mm -hmm. so, so something we, I mean, related to emerging behavior associated to the to the flows. So something we, we explore though is, is not what you were asking, but to, so imagine now that you have a filament that, that is broken, or you have a connection between a filament then again, these flows help to transfer motors or cargos from one to the other. So that also has an impact in, in how transport or you know, trying to understand transport in, in more complex environments. But, but yeah, uh, the, bidirection, yeah. the bidirectional case is definitely interesting. Thanks, thanks. Uh, um. Yeah, Prasad, uh, can you unmute? Yeah, hi, Ignacio. Uh, just a quick question uh, for the first part of your uh, talk. I was just one, two things I was wondering. One is that uh, all your uh, simulations uh, in the MIPS thing looked like they were in 2D. So uh, what I was wondering was that if you either look at a confined system or so, uh, so a three-dimensional system, but confined in some way, uh, how does this transition change? I mean, does one, uh, uh, mm. because of, because there would be some kind of additional damping which would be present in the system because of the confinement in, in the sense that if your particles are going to keeping on banging onto the walls again and again, so yeah. there would be, uh, so how does, because in any realistic system, unless you know, either you would be on a substrate and then that would introduce some kind of an interaction or you would be a three-dimensional system with some confinement. So I was wondering that how, how do these transitions change because of that? And the related question was indeed that if one just takes this model, but switch on a hydrodynamic coupling. So in the sense that uh, the equation for X dot becomes actually X dot is equal to U plus VSP. 
and uh, you you can even assume a stokesian hydrodynamics and there at least confinement seems to have a dramatic role right in terms of ordering dynamics and so i would like to know your comments on that so so for for 3d without confinement the main features remain the same this has been explored confinement yes there, there are also quite a number of studies in confinement as you said the role of the walls is is very relevant because again this stubbornness the persistence then of the particles and lead to very easily the formation of dense structures at the walls then depending on the type of confinement and the the uh, the the, the competition between different relevant length scales, you can think of this as a way of a, a wetting type behavior, where then you would form the type of mix MIPS structure, but starting from the walls. But there, there may be cases where, again, if the walls are irregular, or if you have other type of uh, effects, then other, I mean, for, for example, if you have a, a circular confinement, you could break the symmetry and, and start generating flows well. So it, it is very rich. And as I was saying, I mean, this, these are really non-equilibrium systems. I've been using a lot this uh, analogy with equilibrium. And I think it's good to, to have an idea about what are the, the relevant symmetries and the, the structures and morphologies that emerge. But it's true that when, you, when it comes to the con confinement, uh, what is the right way to analyze the, the different regimes of the systems becomes more involved. And in particular, I think it's very interesting to try to understand when sustained flows can be developed and how those depend on confinement, e even without hydrodynamics, eh? just out of, of uh, activity. Uh, there are works uh, along those lines. I don't think the understanding that we have is still uh, thorough enough. Now, regarding to the, the hydrodynamics, I agree with you. One can easily, in principle, I mean, conceptually, as you say, add uh, hydrodynamic coupling to, to these particles. The, there are works uh, along those lines. Then uh, there is typically a competition between the, the, the tendency to MIPS is there, but then depending on now whether it's not only relevant to think about how they propel, it's also a question whether they are pullers or pushers, the type of stress they yeah. can and then there are cases where MIPS will survive, and there are others where active stresses tend to align. If you, if you want, it's like a G-type term that I was uh, talking about, but with hydrodynamics that then will lead to uh, a big check type phenomenology. If now you put walls, as you were saying, then you have all these elements that were. Yeah, sure. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But, but then you, I mean, that's, that's clearly relevant and, and interesting. Okay. Thanks a lot. Ignacio, I may ask a couple of questions. Yeah. So regarding hydrodynamics, the, so the later part, how exactly did you include hydrodynamics in your model? What method did you use? So I use a method that is called dissipative particle dynamics. It's an, uh, an okay. solvent method. So right. yeah. Yeah. And uh, the other question is, uh, so in the uh, chiral systems that you're studying, right, you see these droplets. Um, so did you say that maybe you already mentioned this? Do you see coarsening in, the, in such systems, coarsening of droplets? OK, so that that's, I mean, I think there is still quite a number of things that need to be clarified there. But in, in the simplest case that I was showing you, where all particles have the same chirality and there are point particles, there there was a regime where they form, they coarsen to a one microscopic aggregate. But then there were this other regime in which there were micro uh, aggregates. While in the case of the mixture, we always observe a macroscopic, I mean, no, sorry, we, we observe a macroscopic aggregates with particles of opposed chirality. Now, how, how do you go from one to the other and how robust these different morphologies are? Uh, this is still unclear to me. I see. And also if the movement of these individual particles within these droplets, do they follow some sort of a circular motion or is it an average circular motion or uh, statistically more statistically it's a circular motion i see okay okay yeah thank you anirban hi ignacio nice talk yeah i had a question about the last part where you see that bunch of i mean there is a organization and that the i mean emergent organization in which the particles tend to bunch and move together forward so are such kind of movement seen in experiments? I, I'm not aware of. Okay. 
And, now, okay, and another, say, yeah. yeah. Another connected question is that given that your uh, volume is probably conserved and it's an incompressible fluid, such a, a concerted motion will also generate a fluid current in the backward direction. Such yeah. things also should be measure, measurable, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely, what you say is true. And, and that's also relevant from what I said, I mean, and then it's because normally these are flows on the confinement, let's go to the questions of Prasad as well. So this means that then the, these are, it's not just this, I, I've been talking about this collective motion, but obviously that leads to flows that will span over the whole system. Uh, the, this experiment I was referring from Goldstein on, on these microtubules moving, I mean, sorry, motors moving on microtubules in that cell, there, they quantify the flows that the motors uh, produce in the cell. And they are also quite intricate because the, 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 the um, microtubules have an opposed polarity with, uh, with a chirality. So then, yeah, so there is a whole flow that, is, that this, these motors uh, give rise to. Yes. That, that's what I said that this may have important, this can be of important relevance for the metabolism of the cell because it's just the, the overall cytoplasm that can be affected by such motion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My question was about uh, about that. That given that this uh, microtubule sort of crisscross the cell in not a definite manner, but sort of in all directions, uh, at the cytoplasmic level, would you see any kind of cytoplasmic uh, streaming because of yeah, I, individual microtubules? Probably unlikely. So I, I, I'm not a biologist, so I don't know. Maybe yeah, but okay. very naive. But I, I think that in cells you can have very different type of, of environments. It's very, I mean, if you want this, this example of the plant cell that I was showing, is, it's a bit specific in the sense that the, the microtubules are really aligned on the walls of the cell. If you think in cases where you think more on the um, cytosol of, of an eukaryotic cell, now where you have a structure, a three-dimensional, more gel-like structure of these microtubules, then they are obviously the, the, I mean, I don't expect an overall flow because it's more like a gel. So then there is more a question. I don't know if, if, if the flows that are locally generated are relevant or not. Yeah. So I, I think it depends very much on the, but for example, also in, in neuron, uh, when, you, when you have a neuron in the axon, the axon has also a, a clear directionality in, in how uh, the cell is structured. So I would think that there are cases where, yes, the overall structure of the cell favors the emergence of this uh, uh, streaming. In other cases, it will be more a local disorder that can lead to dispersion, but not not to give rise to any particular flow structure. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Amitabha. Um... Uh, hi, Ignacio. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, so uh, I had a quick question uh, related to the first part of your uh, talk. So where uh, you had been studying this um, minimal, minimal model of active matter and you started increasing, like making the phase space richer by introducing more interactions. Like you used a combination of excluded volume interaction and also alignment interaction. Now, uh, in those cases, like uh, has there been any study uh, of the, if, if there is any intermittent like behavior in the system, for example, like when the like system is trying to form any large cluster and then breaks down and that kind of thing. So hmm. is it known in this kind of systems it, it shows any kind of intermittent dynamics? Um, in general, I would say yes the behavior can be more complex. If you want, I've been classifying general features. Uh -huh. When I was talking about a lane or the band, uh, we, I, I didn't emphasize that, but we were taking a, an elongated geometry to stabilize one. If, if you have a large system, you can have many of them that will interact with each other. In the case of the pneumatic order, the behavior is much more rich and dynamic. So. In general, yes. I, I think here there is on the one hand a question to which extent this type of complexity you refer to can be statistically understood in terms of an average phase or not. And, and the other side of the coin is even if you can characterize a, a phase, it's true that, what's that what is going on can be very rich because it's very dynamic. Uh, 
And mm -hmm. probably it's not only relevant to say, okay, it's a phase with this overall symmetry uh, that is broken. It's probably important to understand what is really happening to, to the system. And then what you say is, is very uh, relevant. And, and if you put hydrodynamics, for example, there are all these studies about how you enter into turbulent uh, structures and turbulent flows, yeah? turbulent light flows. So yeah, it, it can be very, very rich uh, in general. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, I think there's one uh, question in the chat box. Um, Arpan Sinha, would you like to unmute yourself? So maybe I can read it. How does one motivate uh, non zero chirality uh, origins? Yeah, I mean, the, the net chirality, as I was saying, the, the, there may be different sources for chirality. One obvious one that is, has been reported extensively is the fact that uh, micro swimmers, when they swim close to a wall, uh, then they, in, in some cases, they, they can break. I mean, in the bulk, they would more or less move uh, in a straight line, but because of the stress they generate in the flow, the coupling of the stress to a wall can lead to a circular motion. That's one uh, way to, to, to lead to that. Actually, for self propellant colloids, it is known that if the Peclet number is large enough, there, there may be a symmetry breaking that induces a chirality. And then in that case, it can be right or left. And, and there are microorganisms that, I mean, for example, the um, ball box, that is a microorganism which has many cilia, naturally, because of how the cilia move, they, they can lead to uh, spontaneous rotation. So there are different sources in, in biology or in, in, in the lab to to give rise to a spontaneous chirality. Uh, thank you, are there any more questions? So in that case, uh, let me thank uh, Professor Ignacio Pugnabaraga for this uh, very nice talk. And uh, thank you all for uh, a, a very lively session with a lot of interactions. And uh, thank you. And uh, in, in this series, we'll have the next uh, colloquium on 13th of July. So thank you all once again. Yeah, thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.